Si on parle, t'entends ou pas On entend son micro, c'est parfait. Uh, ok, so we are about uh, to start. So welcome uh, every, everyone. I uh, just want to make sure that uh, on the YouTube everything is fine. Samuel, everything is fine. We checked. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, welcome to this hybrid event, uh, the filter workshop that we are uh, organizing here uh, in uh, presence in uh, Bordeaux, France. Uh, and uh, online on the YouTube channel of the student branch of uh, Bordeaux. Um, so this event is uh, organized by the TC5, the Technical Committee 5 of the MTTS Society of the IEEE. Um, and uh, le, the locally organized by the IMS Research Center in Bordeaux and uh, the student branch. Uh, of Bordeaux de Bimach. Uh, we also have the support of uh, Accent Solution, uh, which is uh, a, co a, uh, a company uh, in the uh, F and MacroEV uh, domain that will make a, a presentation during the workshop. Uh, and also the uh, G Salbatros, which is a group of interest between uh the labs of the campus of bordeaux and limoges and um Thales. um so i will make a brief uh, presentation of the schedule uh, that uh, we are going to share on uh, on linkedin um so uh, today we are going to have uh, a presentation from professor afat mansou that uh, is going to start soon uh, he will make an introduction of the topic, uh, then an, uh, he will talk about uh, an analysis of multiple microwave networks. Uh, we will have a uh, stop at 12 and come back at 2 p.m. Uh, we will manage to keep the, the schedule such that it will be uh, uh, very convenient for the online attendees. Um, then we, uh, at 2, we will have a presentation about uh, microwave resonators, and we will finish the day with fundamentals of uh, filter synthesis uh, and filter functions. Tomorrow, uh, we will start at 9 uh, with a presentation on pulse and zeros of filter functions. And after the morning break, uh, we will have a presentation on uh, coupling matrix synthesis techniques uh, that will continue the afternoon uh, and uh, at utmost 4 p.m. Uh, I will myself make an introduction on airfield substrate integrated wave gas filters. Uh, to finish on Friday, uh, Professor Mansou is going to uh, start uh, at 9 a.m. and present physical realization of uh, example of EM-based design of macro filters. Uh, after that, after the break, we will have a presentation from Exas that will present some practical designs of filters and maybe some uh, test facilities that they have also. Okay. Uh, and in the afternoon, we we'll have the opportunity to welcome Cristiano Tomassoni, which is, which is the vice chair of the TC5 uh, and the actual, uh, one of the actual distinguished macro lecturer of the uh, MTTS society. And it will, it will make a presentation of additive manufacturing technology for microwave filters. Um, so, um, Prof, um, uh, Professor Hafet Mansou is, is, is going to start soon. I just want to say that we uh, welcome questions from the YouTube uh, channels um, uh, and also from the attendees, of course. Um, so, uh, Please uh, don't hesitate to, uh, for the online attendees to ask your question online, uh, and we will manage to uh, to uh, to ask the, the question to Professor Rafat uh, Mansour at, at the end of uh, each presentation. Uh, we may have to select some questions if we have too many, uh, because we remember we have to keep uh, the time. 
so I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Professor Afat Mansour. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mansour, for the, the opportunity of visiting, visiting us in Bordeaux and also to, uh, to share your, uh, your expertise uh, related to uh, the filters. Uh, so the floor is yours, Professor Mansour. <coughs> Does not show up here. And here. We can make the pointer as well. So there was an issue uh, with the <laughs> setting. Online it's fine, but... Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Should we start now? Huh? Yes. We can start. Okay. So, good morning, everyone, and good day uh, for those who are uh, online, uh, whenever you are. So, we're gonna have roughly two days and a half for. Uh, hearing about filters uh, for communication systems. As um, uh, Anthony mentioned, there will be uh, today's, we're going to talk about some initial fundamentals of filters. Tomorrow there will be a little bit um, more details. I just would like to highlight that uh, the material for this workshop, or at least the part which I present, is based on that filter book, which is the second edition of um, of that book. The first edition was published in 2007, and the second edition was published in 2018. So the outline of my talk is as follow. Usually, I give this course at the University of Waterloo as a graduate course. It's 36 hours of teaching, and the course involves assignments and the project and as well final exam. And the 36 hours are given over a four months period, the term period. So the students have the opportunity to do the assignments, to do the project, to do things, to work with MATLAB, to work with HFSS, to do real design. So it really gives them tremendous opportunity to go deep, deep, deep in details and understand every word in this course. Uh, also, I give this course um, to industry, uh, usually it ranges from one day uh, to four days. And usually for industries, there will be a typical requirement. They want me to focus on particular uh, topic. Uh, for this workshop, since there were many people online, I don't know the background of those who are attending online. So it was really tough for me to come up with the content, to condense 
in two in two days and a half. So I organize it in a way such as that for those who are very, very, very uh, have limited information about the filters, they can benefit. And for those who have deep information about filters, they can benefit as well. So I hope everybody will benefit from that, from that course. And uh, along the two days and a half, if you want me to focus on things more or to reduce uh, presentation of certain parts, please let me know. I can tailor the presentation to the way you like. And of course, the people online as well like. So for my portion of this workshop, going to give to introductions, we're going to talk about various types of filters from all types of filters available. And then some people actually in here requested to have uh, a presentation on multi-port micro networks, which based on chapter five in this book. So just briefly, I'm going to talk about the multi-port analysis. And then we're going to talk about micro resonators and in and out about micro resonators and how to measure the Q, a loaded Q and Q of micro resonators. And then today we are going to talk about convention census technique for uh, filter circuits, simple technique. So for those even who, who can really start working and designing filters. And tomorrow we're going to go a little bit uh, more deep into uh, census, advanced synthesis technique and coupling matrix techniques. And then we'll end, we'll talk about uh, some of the tricks and technique people use to get uh, a good EM design or physical realizations of, um, of these filters. So for filters, when we talk about filters, we uh, basically, as we know, we have low pass, we have band pass, we have high pass, uh, we have band reject. Uh, frankly speaking, all depend on the same modeling technique. Like if you know one, you will know the rest. Uh, I mean, we're going to focus mainly on uh, uh, low pass and band pass because we start with low pass and we go up to to the to the pan pass pass configurations. But let's start agree on certain terms and definitions along this course. So when you have a filter like that, when we define insertion loss means, insertion loss means the insertion loss within, within the band. Now, the return loss, the return loss is based on the reflections you would like, uh, the, the, how much the signal reflected. Obviously, you need a filter uh, which is very good return loss. I mean, it's negative, but we always use, uh, we call about positive. So we say 20 dB, 23 dB. In industry, which I used to work with, I used to work for a space-based company. When we build filter, we use not to accept anything below 23 dB, 23 dB. And also, when we define the bandwidth, uh, many people sometimes, you hear people saying 3 dB, uh, the bandwidth is the 3 dB of the insertion loss. No. The bandwidth in filters is defined as the bandwidth where the return loss you have. If it acceptable return loss 20 dB, that's where you define the bandwidth where the 20, the 20 dB. So when we talk about bandwidth, we should say, we should talk about the return loss bandwidth. Uh, also the, 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 the rejection, rejection is, is, is critical, critical important, but Basically, when you design filter, you worry about insertion loss, you worry about return loss, you worry about selectivity, you worry about bandwidth, but also as a parameters like power handling capability, intermodulation product, the PIM product for many applications are very, very important. Loss variation, it's not only the loss, the absolute loss uh, in, the, in the band. There are particularly in space applications the loss variation is extremely important. Even in the input side, in many system, the loss variation is more important than the absolute loss. Also the group delay, the group delay, size and mass. So there are many parameters which people need to look at when they look at designing of, uh, of filters. And when we talk about filters, when we talk about filters, we all know the symbol here, Chibi chip filters, okay. 
but reality reality in majority of applications in wireless base stations and satellite applications and uh, even mobile applications as well okay the filters required what we call it just called elliptic or quasi elliptic filters which have tremendous tremendous uh, requirements or rejections requirement because the spectrum is so expensive very 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 expensive people just you know pay lots of money to get a portion of the of that spectrum so the requirements on the rejection are very very strict and most filters are used in majority majority of applications required to have transmission zero in a specific location to be able to meet the requirements nevertheless nevertheless in many many applications and still in wireless and and satellite, we use this simple chip chip filter applications. Uh, so it's still the chip chip filter, traditional chip chip filter is being used. So today, today, at the, by the end of this, by the end of um, uh, today, you will be able to go to design to do synthesis and EM design of of this type of filter. So uh, we're gonna go through details to figure out everything how to do design of uh, these simple chip chip filters and tomorrow we're going to talk about the synthesis technique how to get really these particular transmission zeros and the ins and outs as well of how to get the the different different forms different layout and as well the physical realization of of uh, of, of this type of uh, of filters but more or less, it's the same. It's just different modeling technique. This is modeling technique is a bit easier than the modeling technique. Here, it's quite general. It's quite general because once you get the modeling for the elliptic, of course, as a special case, you can get uh, the traditional Chibichev uh, filters. So application of filters, of course, to use in many applications. Channel selection, channel selection. I mean, in wireless, we have various bands and in satellites as well. You have different beams coming from different locations. You need to select particular channel. You need to select the channel. So channel selection is important. Interference cancellation, interference cancellation from adjusting channels from uh, a hostile, hostile, uh, uh, channel coming or interfering and all of that so you need filters to really to provide uh, cancellation cancellation and uh, also in terms of requirements of uh, oscillator uh, requirement of oscillator phase noise as you know on most transceivers you have RF signals you down convert it to an IF lower frequency and then you you process it the process of conversion you need the mixer and the oscillators and the oscillator have a phase noise if you use filter if you don't use filter uh, that you need to have a phase oscillator with excellent excellent phase noise however using filter relax the requirement as i will explain here so for example here like if you have a system and if you have a wide band filter like that and if you have a phase noise oscillator phase noise with oscillator with such this is not a good phase noise a good phase noise give you extremely sharp oscillator so you can see here if you have wide band filters you get interference in the signal at the output so the if is just saturated by by the interference however if you use narrow band filter here in this case for example okay still you have an oscillator which is not a very good phase noise but you still will be able to reduce the, the, the so filters help you to really, uh, one of the requirements is to relax the phase noise of oscillators. Also, also filters are used not only for filtering, it's used for many other applications. Like you can make a phase shifter using filters. You can make a phase shifter using filters. You can make embed as matching network using filters. We having a papers coming, on that, how to use filters to realize very interesting uh, uh, embedded matching networks for antenna applications. Okay, so I mean, it's just, it's just a piece or a two-port network which you can shape and play with, so it allows you to realize 
many, many, many components. So certainly there are tremendous, tremendous application of filters. And even, even, even if we, I don't know when it's going to happen 20 years from now or so, where everything becomes digital, you still, at the input, you still need filters. You still need filters somehow. So filters are always uh, needed and required. So, so when we talk about some brief applications uh, for filter for wireless base stations, as you can see, we have different bands. Um, uh, you need you need a filter for each band, and uh, this both on the receiver side and uh, transmission transmission side or transmit side. So you need as well different different bands for base stations. For for satellite applications, for satellite application, this a little bit thing changed a lot in satellite over the past uh, 23 years. But this is just highlight just overall category. But really, there are many many uh, new things coming nowadays. So so typically you have it's just the the what we call it bent pipe payload. These are acts like a repeater. A repeater just you get a signal. Or beam from the ground, you amplify it and you distribute it. Okay, and so this is in the case of fixed satellite systems or direct to home, which does not exist much anymore. But for mobile and multimedia, you need to do processing. You need to do processing, and we need to do processing as we we'll see. You need many filters. You need many filters uh, to do that. But for fixed, for traditional satellite systems. You have the, the the input signals, and then you have a duplexer to separate the receive from the transmit, and then so through some circulators, the receive signals will go, and you have a bunch of channels. We call it input multiplexers, input multiplexers, and then what you amplify those channels, and then you select them as well at the output multiplexers. And then you combine them and you send them back to ground. Okay, so that's just basically the bent, bent pipe uh, uh, type multiplexer. And by the way, the switch matrices here are used is just because those receivers are not reliable. Those receivers are not reliable. Filters, passive filters are reliable. People don't worry about them. But for uh, for uh, for receivers or HPA high power amplifiers, people use switches, redundancy switch matrices to be able to direct the signal in case there is a failure of some of those of those receivers. So this is another way to explain it a little bit. So you have the antenna here, the beam forming network. You have IFA. IFA, this is simply a chip very, very wide band filter. Uh, we used to build it in the company I used to work, just 500 megahertz filter, allow you to cover all channels coming from a particular beam, okay? And then you have the input switch matrix and the receiver. And as I said, you need the, these switch matrices because some of these receivers can fail. It's active, fail. And then you will be able to route the signal. And then you have the input multiplexers. Now, what's interesting about the input multiplexer because you amplified the signal, the absolute insertion loss is not required. It's not a, an issue. However, however, the loss variation is extremely, extremely important. And the group delay is extremely important. So you still need high Q for those type of filters, not for to be able for, to reduce the, uh, the insertion loss, but to be able just, just, just to get the, the, the loss variations. And then you will have as well the same thing for the HPA. And unfortunately, because the HPA, they cannot really deal with wide band signals. So you will probably need an HPA for each, for each channel. However, and then you will have, you combine this, this signal through output multiplexer. Here, the absolute insertion loss is very, very, very important. Absolute insertion loss. So the law you need, low insertion loss for output multiplexer filters because that as well impact how much uh, the high power uh, because HPA 
has efficiency. So the more DC power, the more power you need, the more DC power. So insertion loss is critical in the output multiplex. Absolute insertion loss. And as well, loss variation. At the input multiplexer, only loss variation is important. So still need high Q to be able to get low loss variations along the path. And uh, the, for, for, for satellite, which use onboard processing, you know, the typical uh, traditional satellite or fixed surface satellites, they have a beam, it just acts like a repeater sky. This is a beam used for, for many years. Of course, nowadays, uh, you will have to be able to maximize the, 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 the spectrum. And if you have uh, different, each beam have different channels, you'll be able to do processing and you direct the beams back according to where, where, where the requirement. So this is shows a little bit more. So if you have, say, a beam coming from North America, Middle East, Europe, uh, they need to go uh, somewhere, certain calls or certain channels need to go, particularly to North America. So we'll be able to do uh, processing on board of the satellite. When you do processing, you need many filters. You need, you need, you need many filters, and you need as well switches. You need switches to be in doing that. So, uh, just filters are being used. Just to give you an idea, uh, so when I left the industry back 24 years ago, uh, when we used to build the satellites, we used to be the number of channels for input multiplexers ranging from 60 to 80. 60 to 80. For example, I remember Intel Set 8 there was 60 channels for the input multiplexers, okay? So 60 number, 60 filters for, for inputs and uh, outputs. For mobile, mobile applications, mobile applications, well, your cell phone, same thing, same thing. You have different bands, uh, you know, you, you see the names, you hear the names. Again, you have the antenna. You have different bands, you have LNAs, and uh, and then you do down conversions and you do the same thing as well for, 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 for the high power. Now, for cell phones, the number of filters keep increasing as well. It keep increasing significantly. So you can see here, if you look at here, look at it here. In 2010, people were talking about nine filters, 10 filters, okay? Now, for 4G, people started to talk 40 filters or so. For 5G, people talking about 90 or 70 on 70 filters and keep increasing, okay? Those are filters, are very, very special filters. They are acoustic filters. I'll briefly talk about them, okay? These are very, very interesting filters. And uh, you guys keep an eye on those filters because one day the technology will develop in a way such as that, it will compete with the traditional uh, RF filters because they try to push them higher in frequency. And uh, so, but lots of filters needed for, um, for, for mobile um, applications. Okay. So when we talk about, this is just a, a sketch showing uh, different types of filters um like for example like you can see here it is uh this is a waveguide this is waveguides have been used uh, for years this is a waveguide it's a dual mode waveguide allow you to reduce the size uh coaxial coaxial is used a lot as we will see some of this application micro strips there are hundred types of micro strips. Um, and of, uh, there is dielectric resonator. Dielectric resonators are uh, really, it's, it's more or less the BMW of filters because they are very good type of, um, in terms of the Q and size. Uh, so they are being used a lot in wireless base stations and as well in satellite applications. Of course, lambda elements, lambda elements you can make lambda elements very very tiny filters using inductors and capacitors and you can as well have acoustic 
uh, acoustic uh, filters uh, as well as you see as you see here so there are several types and this is just a sample there are hundreds of thousands of filter possible filter configurations but this is just this is just the some 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 of the categories of of of, of these filters okay so this is really an interesting photo we took back 1994 when i was at comdab it shows it shows different type of filters but shows as well the evolutions evolution of filter technology which is very interesting because this is the so-called just standard waveguide um I, I forgot to mention here there are many variations like for example we hear we're gonna hear have a talk about siw uh filters which is combination of waveguide and the and PCB board, which is amazing technology. We're going to hear as well about 3D integration, 3D filters. 3D filters, it's interesting because it allow you to make shapes which <coughs> non-traditional shape of filters. But this photo is very interesting, as I said. It shows the evolution filter. So the, the large waveguide here, this what have been used, believe it or not, in satellite application in the 60s, first satellites. They were using just simple waveguide. But you can see the size. All of them, by the way, all of them, all of them are eight pole filters, eight pole filters here. Okay. And then later on in the 70s, in the 70s, there is a company um, called Comsat in the US. They came up with a concept for dual mode. Dual mode is that is in the case, uh, in the sense that instead of using physical cavity, for one resonator, you can use the same physical cavity for two resonators. So that reduces the size significantly. So you can see here, it's a dual mode cavity. It's again, eight pole filter, but you can see significant reduction in size. Later on in the eighties, in the eighties, dielectric resonators came, dielectric resonators came, and again, it's eight pole, eight pole, eight pole and dual, dual band, dual band okay a dual board i'm sorry so you can see much much smaller in size there are some other variation like this one we built this one we have a pattern from this one combining dielectric resonators and with some at that time we use superconductor metal high low loss to get much much smaller size and this is the micro strip the micro strip in here in size so all these filters are eight poles eight poles but shows the evolution, evolution of filter technologies from the 60s uh, to, to, of course, there are many, many variations nowadays. For lambda elements, for lambda elements, you can see here uh, filters we actually build, just lambda element filters at 2 gigahertz. It's tiny, small, 2.3 and 3.7. Of course, if you build it using metal, it will be lossy. However, if you build it using a superconductor, it will be it will be okay. Uh, so filters, acoustic filter, 900 megahertz. You can see they are so tiny, 1.3 millimeter, 2.3 millimeter, so tiny. So this is again shows you some some of uh, of, of of these filters uh, configuration and their uh, evolution. So where are the applications? Where are the applications being used here? So if we have, we define here the insertion size, the insertion loss and size. Insertion loss and size. You can see you have the waveguide, which is great in terms of the insertion loss, but the size is quite large. It comes after that, the electric resonator, coaxial, microstrip, lambda element. Acoustic, acoustic, is in here somewhere in here because you have extremely extremely uh, low size and social loss i'll say between microstrip and coaxial okay it's closer to the microstrip uh, has not reached coaxial of course the superconductor is the greatest but superconductor you need cooler so that's you need to take into consideration the cooler the cooler uh, size uh, we back in the 90s, we developed the 60 channel multiplexers, 60 channel multiplexer for Intel SAT 
using superconductor and including the coolers, including two coolers, because we were using just simple microstrip rather than dielectric resonators, we almost saved 50% in size and mass. Okay. So, so if you have large number of filters, yes, you can afford the cooler, the overhead of the coolers, and you'll be able to still gain by going to superconductivity. But of course, if you have few filters, uh, unless really, really need the requirement, you need to add the cooler size and mass, that's, that's, you will not compete on size. But if we look at the application, what are being used? For wireless base stations, what's being used? It's coaxial and dielectric, coaxial and dielectric, okay? And sometimes you use SIW now because SIW can give you as well reasonably uh, good Q, much better than uh, the, the, the micro strip, somewhere in here in terms of, uh, of Q. The profile is so low as well, and because you use dielectric, effectively substrate, it reduces the size. For satellites, for satellites, they will use dielectric and waveguides. Also, also, there were some applications, particularly for uh, uh, lower orbit satellites, they were using acoustic uh, devices for satellite application. For mobile, mobile applications, certainly back in 3G, they were using dielectric uh, type resonators when they have few filters. Now when they have 70 or 80 filters, they have no choice but to use acoustic filters, okay? Uh, transceivers, if you make a Wi-Fi terminals or any transceiver for wide applications, you use microstrip or lambda elements. A monolithic, if you have RFIC chip, you need a filter there. You have nothing to do but use lambda element basically to realize, to realize that filter function. So this shows you the filter applications for all these uh, resonators uh, based on the basically the size and mass. Okay, if we go to 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 um, the this application, but if you know about the requirements, requirement, if you need low loss, if you need low loss, you have no choice but to use as a dielectric waveguide and acoustic for mobile. For mobile, because, uh, you know, mobile, they can use lambda element, but they cannot use lambda element. It's so lossy. Acoustic, acoustic, they can get a Q of 1,000, believe it or not. Very tiny filters at 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, they can give you a Q of 800 to 1,000. Lambda elements will give you, what, give you what, Q of 30, 40. So, so for low loss, for mobile application, you need to use acoustic. For wireless and satellite applications, you can use dielectric and waveguides. And some people can afford as well coaxial. Coaxial, because coaxial, reasonably, uh, around 3 gigahertz, you can get a Q of 4,000 or 3,000. So it's still, it's still a management. For high power, if you need high power, if you need high power, Extremely, extremely high power. You have no options but but waveguide. Coaxial as well can give you high power. Dielectric, you may be able to still get high power, but there are some problems. The reason is because the dielectric, um, when you have high power, it gets heated. And uh, the dielectric material, when it heats, the loss tangent increases. The loss tangent increases. And when loss tangent increases, <laughs> such a loss increases. Okay? And where insertion loss increase, there are more more heat. So there is certain certain thing you may be able to do uh, for um, 100 watt, 200 watts dielectric resonators, but you cannot get you cannot get the kilowatts or 500 watts or one kilowatts for dielectric resonators. Uh, so so waveguide obviously is a way to go. For coaxial, you may be able to do it, but again. You may have a breakdown because coaxial, you have small gaps. Uh, so it could be a PEM product, passive intermodulation product, or, or breakdown. Uh, for millimeter wave, for millimeter wave, you know, trend now going to a very, very high frequency. And, uh, um, 
and uh, the, the options you have nothing but waveguide or siw for example siw is also a very good candidate for uh, millimeter wave uh, frequencies um, people demonstrated have demonstrated the waveguide filters to up to 200 gigahertz or so uh, even the electric loaded very very tiny filters so for millimeter wave you have no option but to use a uh, waveguide for uh, for low frequency low frequency applications low frequency applications you have nothing but lambda elements because any other components even the electric resonator at low frequency will be quite large will be quite large uh, just to give you an idea um, uh, at two gigahertz at two gigahertz uh, a waveguide will be roughly the diameter will be roughly two two point two inch in width for example correct if you work on waveguide if you work on dielectric resonator you probably need 1.2 inch diameter around two gigahertz for argument's sake let alone if you go lower lower frequency so for for lower frequency if you talk about 900 megahertz 700 megahertz uh, or even lower much lower you can use lambda element micro strip or acoustics okay some people in wireless they used to use coaxial as well and uh and um, dielectric resonators for 900 megahertz, but that's for base stations where they can afford the size for it. So this just show you an overall uh, about where in terms of the uh, applications. So let's let's see now some <clears throat> some of the filter configuration. This is the traditional uh, comb line resonators used a lot in. Uh, in wireless space stations, basically you have a comb line, roughly lambda by four, lambda by four, and there are different forms uh, to do. This is the lowest cost. People make it and one one machining, you can machine these things easily, and then you'll be able to make yourself uh, comb line filters. Of course, as well for the plexers, the plexers for wireless space stations, this is one of the main uh, because it's very low cost. People make uh, thousands of those double exits, so it's extremely, extremely low cost. You can see here, you effectively have a manifold, and there, here is one channel, and here is another channel, and you can see, you can see all of this. There is coupling between here and there, and coupling between all over the place, because each of these filters have really they have to be quasi elliptic They are very, very specific transmission zeros because for the plexers, you need the the lower band, you need upper the extreme high rejection in the upper band, and for the higher band, for the higher channel, you need extreme rejection in the lower band. So this has to be elliptic filters, and uh, and you can see the it's used a lot in in, in wireless base stations for waveguides for waveguides i mean there are hundreds of types of waveguides possibly you can make this is just the simplest things and uh, as i said uh, they are good for high power and uh, millimeter wave uh, applications uh, I, I myself designed this one when i was uh, at comdav uh back in the in the 90s this is a duplexer this is where very very challenging duplexers consist of some uh, filters and some um, waveguide filters and low pass filters as well and uh, you, you can see the low pass filters particular filters here needed to be very very it's a duplexer for the high power side we use filter with no with no screws at all, screws at all. So I used to design these things using mode matching technique. At that time, there was no HFSS available and all of that. So we had my own uh, mode matching technique, uh, which I developed on that to be able to design this filter with no tuning screws. And these filters, the, the Lopez filter had extreme rejection up to the force harmonic up to the force harmonic 
with no uh, tuning tuning screws. But just show you a bunch of, this is just what we call it engineering model, the flight model, we're much more advanced, you know, on that. So just give you an idea about some of the waveguide filters look like. <clears throat> for the dual mode, for the dual mode. Uh, this is really amazing, amazing technology. And what's interesting is that when people at Comsat came with that technology, they did not patent. They did not patent that concept. And if really they haven't patent that concept, they would have been flying to the bank because in the 70s and the 80s and, and 90s and even till today, people all use uh, dual mode uh, filters all the times, okay? And um, uh, you will see here, it's just basically two channels and you can have provide screws to couple between the modes in the same resonators. We use cross iris to get cobbling between the two modes so we can shape the stuff. Uh, here, you will see you will see some isolators and all of that just for those who's wondering why do we need those ones the input here isolators and the output isolator and there is something called equalization equalization because the group delays of our filters the group delay of our filter have peaks have peaks at the bandage okay so and they are not really flat very very well flat so there are two ways to do equalizations, to do equalization, something called external equalization, where you use circulators and just cavities, it's just one port device. Uh, if you have time later on, we can explain it, but you can also use self-equalization. Self-equalizations, meaning you can change the coupling values or the coupling elements of the coupling matrix you needed, such as that the filter give you more or less flat group delay okay so so in this case here you will see we were using circulators to provide what we call it external equalization external equalization so this shows example of a filter which is uh it's a band pass connected with a low pass with the low pass filters um you know as just just an example of a waveguide filter now, for the electric resonators, the electric resonators are very, very interesting. And the electric resonators have been known since almost since the 70s, okay? And the 80s, people know, yeah, dielectrics, it's just it's ceramic, I can make a dielectric resonator. But there was major issue for people to use dielectric resonator filters for through commercial filter applications. And the problem with that was basically the temperature drift. They had an issue to be able to control the temperature drift of, of those dielectric resonators. With the uh, development of uh, material technology and material engineering, people managed to be able to control the temperature drifts of, of the electric resonators. And the suppliers right now, the suppliers right now, they let you choose they let you choose this dielectric resonator ranging from, say, minus six part per million to plus six part per million. You can get minus six, you can get plus four, you can get zero, because overall temperature draft of the filter depends on the cavity and the resonator. But back in the back in the 17 and 80, the temperature draft was quite high, it was 1,000. This is, you cannot make a real filter out of it, because over the operating temperature range, the filter will drift. With the development of materials that you, you get really extreme here, uh, excellent, excellent uh, temperature uh, temperature drift. As I said, your choice as a designer, you pick up the temperature you drift is very low because there is also other drift coming from from the housing. But you can see they are they are just simply dielectric resonators here mounted on a ceramic substrate, another low dielectric constant material, and acts as resonators. And you can again use them as a single mode or dual mode, single mode or dual mode. And the, the electric resonators 
they come uh, usually 24, 29 epsilon heart, 24, 29, uh, 38, 40. Uh, people now offer them at 74, 80. Okay. Uh, but also remember for the electric generator, when the supplier provide, they provide QF, Q times F. So you can get QF roughly 100,000, 100,000. So this means like around four gigahertz, you may be able to get a Q of 20 to 35 of, uh, of this direct infinite. So they are allow you to do miniaturizations because of the high dielectric constant. Uh, and at the same time, you can get extremely good Q. Okay, but of course there are some tremendous challenges as well in designing them, particularly in waveguide. You know what you get, the dimensions you get. In dielectric resonators, when you get it from the supplier, they tell you, well, the dielectric constant, let's say 38 plus or minus 0.5. Okay, unless you work with a supplier for a particular batch, it actually varies from batch to batch as well. You work with the supplier from a particular batch, or you do initial analysis when you get the dielectric resonators to figure out what's the dielectric constant so you can work on it. And again, if the dielectric uh, varies from, uh, let's say, 38, varies by 0 0.5, that can shift 20 megahertz the filter. And that's, <laughs> you can't, you don't have that room to get a filter with a margin 20 megahertz. So you need to get it right versus, versus, um, and you still most most there is I never seen the electric resonator filter without a tuning screws. I've seen some wide band waveguide filters uh, without tuning screws, but the electric resonators definitely need uh, tuning screws. So this filter is just single mode, but this is as another filters. I was involved in the design back on that to a company called Nortel at that time for wireless space stations back in the ninety. It was nightmare to get that filter because they have only particular size and you need to fit that size so that we used we had to use dual mode filters dual mode dielectric resonator filters and we attached some low pass filter coaxial filter to get rid of the some of the spurious because the spurious performance of dielectric resonators you have to be careful as well with it because it's not as wide as we get in waveguide so but the, this is one option. There is also type, another type of waveguide of dielectric resonators. You can see in here, there is also, this is just dielectric resonator. Acts like a comb line, but it's just mounted directly on a metal. It has some advantage in terms of high power. Uh, it's not as high as a traditional dielectric resonator mounted on a support, but still uh, gives you a good filter response. For lambda elements, for lambda elements, lambda elements in terms of the filters, synthesis is easy because you deal with L and C, you don't have much, and uh, the physical realization is easy because you need particular L and you need particular C. So uh, this show you some some filters. Of course, the name of the game is how to design them using uh, EM design tools because. Uh, because they are so tiny as well. You don't have room for tuning them. You don't have, once you build it, you have to get what you get. So you have to do it well, and you have to do it right from, from the beginning. <clears throat> Acoustic filter technology. Acoustic filter technology. As I said, this is, as an RF filter designer, you need to keep a look on this on these filters because they are pushing them right now high in frequency and uh, and uh, as well in bandwidth because originally this acoustic filter used to be uh, used for very low frequency megahertz uh, 200 megahertz 500 megahertz 900 megahertz now they went the for 4g they started to use them at 2 gigahertz okay now for 5g they started to use them for uh, 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz, for Wi-Fi terminals, to so operate 7 gigahertz, they start to use them. And there are some papers right now, publications, on using these filters, even up to 15. People making resonators, proposing resonator 15, 20 gigahertz. 
60 gigahertz, believe it or not. Okay, but still in the initial development stage. The Q is not extremely high, but it's okay. But also there are some fundamental problems, not problems, issues, but people manage to deal with it. The spurious. Spurious is so is so uh, very, very uh, you see tremendous spurious performance for each originator. But still people manage to deal with it and use these filters for commercial application. But there are different types, different types of uh, caustic filters. There is uh, Temperature compensated, there is Morata, I have a filter called Morata has a filters, for example, called IHP, uh, incredibly high performance filter, and there is both filters. Uh, there are big players in this area because the market is huge for mobile, for mobile application. But this technology is moving ahead and we see new things every time. Okay, in terms of pushing the operating frequency to a higher frequency. And as well, they had an issue of how much bandwidth you can get. But again, there are work going on to be able to get wide bandwidth filters. And these filters, for example, we built at the University of Waterloo. Uh, give you an idea about this is six pole filters, six pole filters. This was done at nine megahertz. And you can see it's just so tiny, 1.3. In our case, we got a queue about 800 for that resonators, but again, because it's a university lab, uh, people can get higher, but it's just simple thing. It's just basically silicon substrate here. We use silicon oxide and uh, the, 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 the piezoelectric substrate. We use lens and tantalate, and we just have aluminum fingers here, and you get yourself a filter or resonators. You know, this is a resonator, bunch of them to make you a filter. Okay, so let's talk about multiplexers configuration. So we know filters, filters as individual filters are being used, but sometimes they use many applications used in the form of multiplexers and duplexers. Of course, duplexers is just, is just many, many applications. Duplexer, you already combine two of them. Multiplexer, multiplexer, when you compile, when you combine several of them. And there are there are basically, uh, uh, there are four types to do multiplexing, or duplexing, hybrid coupled multiplexer, circulator coupled, manifold coupled. I'm not gonna not talk about the other one because it's not used uh, a lot. It's called directional uh, filter. But let's talk about the advantage and disadvantage of each, of each um, uh, multiplexer. Uh, the circulator type multiplexers. By the way, these multiplexers used to separate the input signal into multiple channels. Also, by combining the different channels into one one signal, it can use both ways. Okay. Here, for example, the circulators. The circulator based on uh, the, you have a circulator and the filters. So you can have input signal, which have wide band. You will be able to separate the separate band using uh, a circulator. Okay. Uh, the, uh, this is extremely easy to design because all you need to do is just make only one filter. There is no interaction effectively between the adjacent filters, uh, unless they make a macro strip or a coax, uh, there'll be some EM interaction, but if it's waveguide and coaxial, they are isolated from each other, as you can see here, uh, with the circulators. And uh, uh, very, very simple to tune. Uh, you, you just on that, but, and it's amenable to modular concept. Me making, you make a three channel. If you want to make five channels, you can add more easily, add more, more circulator. But there are some disadvantages. Well, basically, if you look at the last channel here, the signal has to go through several circulators, right? So the loss of the last channels involve only the, the loss of the filter, but the loss of all circulators. We usually, for input multiplexer, we use this type of, of uh, multiplexing because, as I said, 
The absolute insertion loss for input multiplexer is not critical. However, the loss variations, which is determined by the filter, not by the loss of the circulator, is, is important. You still need high Q. So, so it used a lot, it used a lot for input multiplexer applications. Um, and uh, the problem as well with use for write. For write is just uh, sometimes for PEM is an issue to operate at high power. So there is some, some issues here with uh, operating them at high power. But for the input side, it's used a lot, this type of uh, multiplexer. Examples here, you can see, uh, you can see here there is, see this is, for example, you have four channels and four circulators here. Here, again, you have six channels and six circulators. We built these things when we used that ComDAV back in those days, in the 90s, show these filters, for example, this dielectric. Uh, so this is dielectrics, uh, this is dielectrics, this is as well dielectric. So it's just uh, circulators and individual filters. You make, you design the filters well on its own and you connect them with circulator, you end up, you end up with it, no issue. Now, this is the one which is very interesting, manifold coupled multiplexers. Manifold coupled multiplexers will use manifold or junctions in the case of the plexers, and you combine, you combine the challenge on, on one manifold. This is the lowest loss design, the lowest loss design. And that's why this configuration is what's used in the output side, in the output side, because you need very low loss, absolute low loss filters on the output side. Uh, but however, um, and it's also compact because you can actually, uh, you don't need circulator sometimes quite large. Um, so, so, so it's advantage is low loss, but this advantage, it's very tough to choose the to design because there is tremendous interactions between adjacent channels. Uh, there are old tools. We used to develop tools uh, at Comdav to design these channels. We, we used to make filters, multiplexers, where you can have 12 channels, 15 channels, believe it or not, 12, 15 channels on a single waveguide manifold. Okay. All you look at the input, you see equal rubber return loss, say 22 dB for all channels. And you will see this the channels beside each other. And we used to make them non contiguous most of the time. Contiguous means that these channels are very, very close to each other. They, they interact with each other at the 3 dB level, okay? Uh, if you make non-contiguous when the channels are separated from each other, it's a bit easier to design, but but they are, interact a lot and they require particular uh, designs uh, too. And of course, once you make one, you cannot extend it to make, say, five channels. You cannot say, I'm going to add two channels and extend it, unless you redesign the whole thing to get, say, uh, uh, a wider channel, a larger number of channels. And examples of that, you can see for the manifold coupled multiplexers, you can see here is um, the manifold and here is the filters. This case dual band. Here is another version. We we'll use six channels. The spacing between the channels is very critical. The spacing and uh, uh, between the channel and from the manifold to the channel. And here is as well another quite large number of shells. If you make it a micro strip, you will see uh, it's again just a manifold, and you can make it here with a micro strip. So. So those, those manifold coupled multiplexers are very popular and uh, they are very interesting uh, to, to, to design. Uh, output multiplexers here, this is what you can see here. We use uh, dual mode for the size and as well for low loss. For the plexers, for the plexers. The plexer is a special case of a multiplexer. Uh, you can see this is, as I mentioned, it's used a lot in wireless space stations. Here is a duplexer. This is one channel and another 
another channels here you can see uh, you get from the receive side and the transmit side you need a duplexer duplexer is used in wide range of applications <coughs> there is a third type of manifold of uh, multiplexer is hybrid coupled multiplex hybrid coupled multiplex hybrid coupled multiplexer is very interesting as well because it's amenable to um, to expansion and uh, so basically you have again uh, several wideband signal but and you have a hybrid here hybrid there and two filters for each channel two filters for each channel uh, if you go to the analysis of hybrid the signal is divided into two they go through the two channels and they combine at the output here and nothing goes nothing goes in here okay the advantage of this configuration very very simple to design again each unit by itself is separated you can expand it from five channel to whatever ten channel easily escape them uh, the disadvantage as well the last channel uh that so i'm talking about the advantage it doesn't it doesn't require for right it's just hybrid hybrid uh it's much easy to do and uh, uh they, they they don't interact with each other the channels obviously but the problem with it two major problem is that you need two filters for each channel you need two filters for each channel rather than one filter and also another serious problem is that you need to make sure that this these two passes are balanced in terms of phase and magnitude otherwise if you don't do that you will not be able to get the proper design so the magnitude and phase of each each path these two filters must be exactly identical otherwise you will not get a perfect a perfect response okay and also the problem was uh, with the bandwidth of the hybrid okay typical hybrid give you 10 percent bandwidth right I mean, you can use multi-section, you can get larger bandwidth. So if you need wide band stuff, you need to use hybrid, which are wide band, hand, wide band hybrid. And it's, uh, it makes the structure quite, quite large. Okay. The last two types of filters I want to talk about, just to give you an idea about the, the filters, is tunable filters, just briefly, tunable filters and multi-band filters. Tunable filters is, 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 is very, very interesting. I've been doing tunable filters for many years, 15 years. I'm very much interested in tunable filters because they use used in many applications for, of course, uh, facilitate utilization of the frequency spectrum, uh, suppression of interfering signals. You can make adaptive uh, system or uh, software defined radios, which can reject any interference, can select any band you want, Tremendous, tremendous flexibility when it comes to tunability. Also, to replace large filter bags, as you see, in, imagine when you have wireless pay stations, you have uh, 30 filters. If you make each filter, for example, to be uh, to be uh, tunable, okay, you may be able to reduce the number of filters for satellite applications as well. If you need, say, multiple different bandwidths, you select the bandwidths. Instead of making separate filters and select this filter by switches, or you can use one filter and you change you change the bandwidth, the bandwidth for it. Also, in many applications, people who are uh, doing fixed filters would make thousands of these filters. As you know, in wireless in wireless uh, market the demand is so urgent um, you know the schedule is very 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 important for many for many of those uh, people who uh, assemble filter or need filters so suppliers what they do they used to make uh, several filters put them on the shelf and those filters are tunable so when the customer needs particular frequency they get the filter already on the shelf and you tune it to the proper frequency so so these filters, they make them tunable, but eventually they will be used for fixed filter application. So, but instead of waiting until the requirement comes 
and get it to the machine shop and build the unit. They built these filters, stack it on a shelf, and they made design in them such as that it can be easily tunable. Of course, by, by tuning screws in this case, it can easily tunable to a certain range. But you have to do it by, by tuning screws. You have to make them. It's not such so you say, I'm going to use tuning screws and do it. No, you have to do it in a way such as that when you use those particular tuning screws, you will get the bandwidth you need uh, and uh, the, the center frequency. Because if you look at, say, wireless space stations or even satellite applications, you will see the filter more or less have the same performance in terms of bandwidth, in terms of uh, 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 selection uh, uh, rejection requirement but different center frequencies so so while the space stations or supplier filter used to do that for, to reduce production cost and improve schedule delivery schedule okay of course you can use many wide application now there is a popular system called uh, for full duplex uh, you will need uh, you need tunable filters a lot for uh, tunable uh, application and for mobile uh, applications, um, imagine when I told you if one day we have your phone has 90 filters, if eventually uh, these acoustic filters are made to be switchable or tunable, you can reduce them to, let's say, 45, for example, okay? Or much less number of filters. So, so using reducing the number of filters reduce size and mass is one of major application of filter this show you some applications we developed it shows you uh, examples of, of filters but i just want to tell you tunable filters are extremely tough tough to design anybody can make tunable filters but to make a tunable filter which he has constant bandwidth over the tuning range and over wide tuning range particularly it's extremely challenging Extremely challenge. Okay, so 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 yeah. When you work on tunable filters, you need to design them well, design them properly, because lots of people publish uh, filters. They show even S21. They don't show the retail loss because the retail loss degrade badly. The bandwidth degrade badly. So there's tremendous challenge on that, and there are different techniques. Uh, uh, we we. Uh, we have been talking about i mean there is we added in the chapter in the new version on tunable filters in the filter book and over the past six seven years i published several papers on tunable filters where actually the filters can be even tuned by single tuning elements believe it or not single tuning elements and nevertheless you still can maintain performance by single tuning elements so you can look at some of our publications on uh, mtt transactions Multiband filter, just want to say, multiband filter was quite popular, uh, particularly for 4G, where it's a filter has one input and one output. One input and one output. But instead of giving you at the output one band, it can give you two bands or three bands or so. Okay? And again, the advantage of that, you reduce the size and mass. Because instead of using three filters, for example, you can use just a single a single physical physical device for satellite application for satellite applications when you have you need to beam several beams in the ground instead of using pa for each channel why don't you combine why don't you get say two bands and use the pa the power amplifier to to uh, to amplify uh, these two channels so multi-band filter used for satellite application and being used for, particularly for 4G, there were lots of demand for them for uh, uh, multi-bands. Just examples, examples here of dual band filters. Uh, for example, here, uh, we built this one filters back in the 10 years ago or so. I mean, the, you see the com layer resonator is a traditional used in, in wireless space stations. So by just modifying the structure, so we did increase the size or mass. Mass slightly extra, but the size is the same. But you see at the output, one input, one output, you get two bands. Okay. Here we make we make them, we use the cavity 
we use the three modes in each cavity. Three modes in each cavity. Okay. So traditionally, people make these things to get, say, use this cavity to make, say, waveguide cavity. They make single mode. They use the four pole filter. Okay. What we did here, we designed it such as that. The same structure, same size, but give you three bands. Again, one input, one output, but give you three bands. Okay. So that's again, people will look at this another way. It's somewhere between tunable filter and a fixed filter, but allow you to reduce size and mass. Okay. Again, there are different concepts to realize dual band filters or multi band filters, but the, the best performance will use the, physic the, the, the physical resonator in different mode in the physical resonator to get, to get the bands you need. And we made them using the electric resonators as well. We make triple band using the electric resonators filters. Okay, so this is the last slide in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this section of uh, the course. So we will talk about the filter design steps, really. Basically, you need to figure out what you need in terms of bandwidth, insertion, loss, isolation, group delay. And then you need to identify the circuit model you're going to use. And that's critical as well, okay? And then after you do that, you need to figure out based on the circuit model and based on the model you need and based on the requirement, you need to figure out whether you're going to use coaxial, resonator, the electric resonators, waveguide resonators, lambda element resonators, or whatever. And then after you do that, the name of the game is how to uh, convert the circuit model into physical realizations and to get the filter response. So this part of the course, first part, I just give you overall view about some of the filters used in uh, wireless communication. They are quite outlined. Basically, there are tremendous details in each filter configuration I showed you. Uh, and uh, after the, uh, the afternoon, we are going to talk about the resonators, the resonators themselves. How we need to choose a resonator, what are the criteria of choosing resonators and how to calculate, measured and uh, calculate the Q. And of course, we're going to continue about the, some of the circuit models from today and tomorrow and the physical realization. Okay, so before we go, we break for lunch, there will be a part about uh, multiband uh, analysis. But before we start that, I will stop here to answer any questions uh, you have. Either from the audience here or from the online. Um, well, um, I know online there was one. Um, so, um, slide uh, eleven. Um, So where are done the frequency uh, done conversion here? Uh, if you have some uh, information. Well, that's it's done. It's done here at the receiver side. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and another question also from Anthony. Um, do you know the price of the of, uh, spec, of uh, spectrum in a space application? <laughs> uh, hi. <laughs> oh, that's interesting question. Of course, it varies from uh, time to time and based on the applications. I uh, I've seen some uh, I've seen some uh, news release. People just uh, asking for. Uh, paying millions and sometimes billions of dollars to get the full spectrums and all of that. But uh, I mean, this is just news. I, I don't know exactly how much eventually people pay for that, but certainly the spectrum is quite limited and uh, and people, but they are opening the spectrum right now, particularly when they going into millimeter wave, 
there are rooms now to expand uh, the spectrum. So it's just, uh, it's not as it used to be. People work up to two gigahertz, three gigahertz for wireless or satellite as well. There was particular band, C band, K band and K band. Uh, but I think now they're opening the spectrum for wide range of frequencies, yeah. But truly, I don't know the actual price, but I know it's very, very, very high. Um, thank you for your presentation. I think we can move on to the second one. Okay, if any other questions? I think we will just uh, bring the uh, move one cable to my PC, but it will uh, be the same. So I think you can stop sharing right now. Uh, so, which presentation uh, are you presenting now? Yeah. So, okay. okay. Okay, so you can go full screen. And now, I'll tab. And now, present. Okay. And share screen. Uh, share screen. And do and this one. This one. Uh, this one. No, no, I think it's this one. First screen. This, 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 one. Yes. this yes. is the previous one. Yes. And share. It's uh, correct. Yes. yes. Okay. But it's not there. Yeah. It's not there. Yes. There's no here, there's no need for here. No, no, no need. And okay, the floor is here. Okay, for uh, for the people who are online, if there is an issue with the voice, uh, just please let us know. Uh, as I said, uh, this is just uh, it's a very short presentation on uh, multi port analysis, and again. Uh, this is uh, particularly interesting if you want to design a multiplexers, you need to know because it's a multiport device. So you need to know how how these multiplexers are analyzed and designed. And there are some uh, students in here at Bordeaux, they were asking about, talk about that part of the, of the so, but just the background information on analysis of multiport network. And you'll be amazed that how complicated, complicated, complicated network can be analyzed extremely, extremely simple, and anyone will be able to apply the same technique. So just, just as brief introductions, when we talk about two ports, we can describe a two ports, either by the Z matrix and the Y matrix, ABC matrix or S matrix. They are all basically related to each other, and they all represent the two port, the two port network. And for the Z matrix, for the Z matrix, we know we have here the Z matrix, which we all know, and we can represent it by a T junctions, by a T network like that, where is defined the voltage on one side and the currents on one side, and we can define the Z matrix as follow in here. And for the Y matrix, for the Y matrix, it's related to the inverse of the Z matrix.
given by the eyes on the left and the voltages on the right. And again, you can define it with a pi network. Uh, make sure that this is here minus y12. Many people use y12, but it's actually minus one uh, y12. Y and uh, you can get the, the, the y matrix of the network. And again, as you can see, it's related to the z matrix. Okay. For the ABCD matrix, for the ABDC matrix, we just manipulate a little bit and we use V1, I1, and V2, and we use here intentionally minus I2 because that allow, makes it easy to cascade networks and is defined as uh, that way, the ABCD elements. It's just the definitions, relate the voltage and current on one side. But the beauty about the ABCD matrix, so we need cascade networks, you cannot easily cascade them using the Z matrix or the Y matrix, but the ABCD, as you can see from this simple analysis here, that the total ABCD matrix of these two networks is the multiplication of the individual ABCD matrix of each network. Okay? So you can see here, uh, overall, will be like that. But that's why you will see we use minus I, I2 because now... Minus I2 means the input current for the next stage. And that gives you here that the, the matrices are um, simply multiplied by each other. And uh, easily, easily anyone can prove that there is a relationship between the ABCD and the Z. Uh, for example, because it's the same voltage and the same current. For example, if we let I2 here on both equation to be zero right and then you'll be able to get these equations that gives you right away relationship between a equals z11 over z12 and c equal one over z21 similarly if i let v2 equal zero in both equations i will end up with a relation I, the point i want to make is that is these all matrices they are related to each other and for the scattering matrix, of course, it's related uh, reflected at the two ports, reflected signal at the two ports to the incident at the two ports. And uh, and we really, we know that this parameter S11 is a reflection coefficient at the input port when port two is terminated by match load. And S21 is the transmission from port one uh, to port two. So it's it just, you are familiar with that. Now, the S matrix, this is what we can measure. This with our, as our RF engineer, we can test, we can play with, and we can simulate and all of that, okay? Nevertheless, in RF engineering, we still use a lot the Z and Y matrix because they give us physical insight about the nature or the behavior of the circuits. And eventually, the circuit models eventually can come in terms of L and C's eventually. So so, so, so you need to know, uh, even though we cannot measure, say, the Z matrix in in the lab, we use network analyzer to measure. The, and di di directly, of course, you can convert the S to Z, but directly, you only measure the S parameters. But the other matrices are important to understand the physical inside of, uh, of any circuit. And of course, one of the things we we, we always talk about when uh, people they need to check themselves with the unitary condition, unitary conditions and the reciprocity. Reciprocity, all passive networks are reciprocal, so S12 equals to one. And of course, the unitary conditions. So if you do simulations, uh, usually I suggest to use lossless and to make sure that you got the simulation correct check that unitary condition because sometimes you see a student coming to you with S21 uh, greater than one. And they tell you, well, this is what HFSS gave me. You know, you know, it doesn't work that way. It's just an S11 and S21 must satisfy these equations if you use a lossless network. But we have this famous uh, table, which you see the Posar. And you see it as well in that uh, in the microfilter book, which relate which relate to to the 
the element of the S matrix to the Z and uh, the Y and the, the, the ABCD matrices. Once you know one, you will be able to find the, 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 the other element of the other matrix. There is also something is interesting. One easily can drive. This table is very interesting as well and very useful because it tells you the fundamental components of uh, the ABCD matrix of each component, uh, the Y and transmission line, transformers, the pi network and T network. And here it shows some people ask what is the S parameter of transmission line. S parameter of transmission line is very, very simple. It's just, uh, it's just a phase here, get you uh, things like that. Okay. There's something also, it's very interesting, and um, uh, it's used a lot, particularly if you use simulator, if you use simulator like HFSS or uh, any computationally intensive simulators, uh, these are some of the tricks you can do to reduce the computation time, okay? So if you have a two-port network, if you have a two-port network and you would like to get its, its parameters, one way to do it is to divide it into sub-networks, two sub-networks. One, if you have, say, uh, uh, short circuit or basically uh, uh, electric wall in the center, and one, we have open circuit or magnetic wall, okay? So we have HFS structures, large HFS structure. If it's symmetric, if it's exactly symmetric, and the definition of symmetry, symmetry is that is if you look at the left, and you look at the right, you will see the same configuration. Then at the center, at the center, then you can put electric wall and calculate. It will become one port, for example. It will become one port, and you calculate, you calculate uh, the 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 uh, SE, and here you calculate SM. Okay, so SM here I should have written here SM. So this is for, here it is, SM, that's one port, and here is SE, okay? And once you have SM and SE, you'll be able to do just simple addition. You'll get S11 and S12, okay? And because it's symmetrical, you'll see S22 equal S11, okay? Now, what is the advantage of that? The advantage of that in computation time, believe it or not, it can reduce to almost a factor of, uh, because, in HFSS, the, the, the simulation goes by n square. So, so here, you probably get 2n versus n square. Okay? n, say, the number of meshes, for example. Correct? So, when you have, um, or I'm sorry, if you have, say, if you have, say, let's say the number of meshes in the big structure, 2n, right? So, so computation time will be proportional to 4n square, right? Now, while here, a half, you have the number of meshes n, right? So the computation will be responsible to n square. But you'll do it twice. n square plus n square, 2n square. So we're talking about 2n square versus 4n square. So effectively, you can reduce the computation time by a factor of half. The addition is quick, does take time. Okay, so this is tricks can be done. Not only it can be done on a two port network, it can be done on a four port network. In a four port network, if they have symmetry between the four ports, you can get a quarter, a quarter, and you can get, um, you will be able to do it. I have a slide here, it's in the book actually. You have a slide there which you can do it on even on a, on a four port network, you can do significant, significant reduction in um, in computations when you use uh, HFSS or any other computationally intensive tools. Of course, when you have a cascade, when you have a cascade of networks, uh, that's easy. All you have to do is the simplest way. If you have the S parameters of each network, you can get the ABCD of each network, convert the S to ABCD using that popular table and get the, all the ABCD matrices multiplied by each other. You get the overall ABCD, 
you get the overall BCD, and then you will be able to get the 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 overall uh, the overall ABCD. You convert it to an S matrix. You get the overall S matrix. Okay. Now, so this is just simple touch. Now, I mean, this is a circuit. Most of our circuits are complicated circuits, are multi-port circuits. And uh, one of the famous multi-port circuits is the plexer. It's a three-port or multiplexer. Multiplexer can be 16 ports, for example, 17 ports. Okay. How do you calculate the S matrix of that multiplexer? How do you do that? It's very simple, actually. Extremely simple. Okay. Not only that, not only that, imagine, uh, I'll imagine, imagine you have a network like that. Is it complicated enough to you? You'll be very easy to find the overall S matrix of these networks once you know the S matrix of the individual, of the individual networks. Okay. There is a technique. Uh, which I presented here in chapter five. It's not my technique. It was published by um, by a gentleman by the name of Casey Gupta back in the 80s. It's a very, very interesting technique, a very simple technique to be able to uh, analyze multi-port network as we will see uh, in here. But, uh, but let's talk first about multi-port networks. When we have S parameters, we can actually we can actually uh, define the networks as multi-ports, okay? Uh, the same thing, we define them, we can get the S parameters, the reflective signals, and then the, the, the incident signals in here, right? So we can relate uh, the, the S parameters, okay? And um, um, here, if you have the, the matrix and extended by uh, the ports by length, all you have to do is the result of this matrix is just multiplied by two diagonal elements. You can easily prove uh, that uh, this is a case when you deal with uh, uh, with extension extension of ports. And again, it has to satisfy the unitary condition and the response system that SIJ equal SJ, SJI and ST times S complex conjugate equal the unity matrix U, okay? Similar to the two-port network. But let's see how we analyze a network like that, okay? And there are very, very simple three steps to do, to do on that, okay? Step number one, identify the so-called external ports and identify the internal ports. The external ports, we're gonna call them the P ports, and the internal ports, we're gonna call them the C ports, okay? Now, what is the internal ports? These internal ports are the ports are connected to each other. For example, this is for this matrix, okay, for this network, these internal ports, so that's, we're going to define it as part of the C ports. This internal ports for this network. This port is terminated by a load. So it's internal here. We call it internal. For this, for this network, what are the internal ports? All its ports are internal. For this network, it has three internal ports and two external ports. For this network, it has Internal, 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 and uh, external, external, external. Okay, for this network, this is internal, this external, and this external. Okay, so so our objective now, internal ports. We wanna we have networks connected to each other, but there are ports sticking out. We need to find the S matrix of the external uh, at the external ports. It's almost like you have a manifold and channels. You need at the input, at the output of each filter, okay? But the connection between the manifold and the filters are the internal ports. We are interested in the S matrix between the external ports. So the first step, three steps, as I said. The first step 
is to define in your network the internal ports and the external ports. You call the the the, the uh, external ports P, and you define the P1, P2, P3, whatever, and the internal ports you call them C. You define C1, C2, C3, and uh, and so on. And then step two, step two, you're right, you're right. By the way, when you have the scattering matrix of each network, if it's a three by three network, three port, uh, three by a network of three ports, okay? It's scattering matrix, if you look at it, it's three equations, right? Three equations. V1 minus, V2 minus, V3 minus, is one one is two is one two is three one equal v one plus v two plus v three plus so that matrix gives you three equations they are equation just simple equation if you have another network four port that's four equation okay if you have two port that's two equation so what what you do you rewrite these scattering matrices but in the form of a larger equations so if you have a network four port three port Five port, so we have four plus three plus five, so seven plus five, twelve. So it's twelve equations. So you write the the, the as a matrix in that big form, okay? Where you have VP minus and VP plus uh, on uh, for, at the top, and VC minus and VC plus. These are vectors represent the internal ports, okay? In other words. You define the matrix, but SPP here is a sub matrix. It's a sub matrix. By the way, we'll get a numerical example to explain that. So, uh, explain that clearly. Okay. So, you define the SPP. SPP here would be a sub matrix and SPC a sub matrix. And the elements of it coming from the elements of the, uh, the, the sub matrices of the individual network. So this is number, step number two, okay? So step number two is to find, you write the equations that way, rearrange the equation. There's four in here, you get the four, you get it down there, and so on, as we'll see. Step three, you define something called connection matrix. Connection matrix. Connection matrix, you see, it's related the relationship between the internal ports. Because if you think about it, you see, these ports here the, the the reflected from this network is exactly the incident to that network so there is so there is connections with, between the internal ports so we will be easily to define that what's called connection matrix i'm going to call it gamma okay so this one we're going to call it gamma so which you relate uh, which you relate basically vc minus to vc plus Remember, VC is the internal port. C is the internal port. P is the external port. Now, I have I have these two equations. This simply effectively two equation. And here I have another this one. By by manipulating equation one and two, I could possibly get a relation between VP minus and VP plus. Remember, VP minus is uh, reflected of the external ports. VP plus relate the incident of the external ports. Effectively, SPP here is the resultant matrix I need for the overall. So think about it. Think about it. what I've done. I've used three steps. Basically, with these three steps, I define the sub matrices and I define the connection matrix gamma. Once you have these things, now the resultant matrix is simply like that. That's it. Okay. Now may not be clear, so I'm gonna show you an example, numerical example, to make it clear. This example is not in the book. In the book we show an example of a multiplexers, but this example I uh, when I explain when you know when I explain uh, to uh, the students I explain this example. Let's say I have three networks like that. This is a two port connected to a three ports. And one of the ports here is terminated by a load. I'm going to call it C. 
Okay, so let's follow the steps. Let's follow the steps. Let's define the external ports and the internal ports. Okay, so for this network, what are for A, what are the external? One is external and two is internal. For this network, what are the external and the internal? Three is internal, five is internal, four is external. Okay, for this network, it just has one port, six is internal. Okay, right? So effectively, I want to find the S matrix between one and four because otherwise, don't show up. I want to get the S matrix at the output, at the output port between one and four. Okay. So let's say, let's say I have, I know the S matrices of, of these three components, of these three network. I know the S matrix of A, which is given by that. I'm going to call it S11A, S12A, and so on. For B, it's a three port network. So I know it's S matrix. I'm going to call it S11 um, B, S12 B. I use the same one and two, but the port here is three and four, by the way. But I call it B, S21 B, S22 B, and so on. But the ports here is related to that. And this is one port network. I know V6 equal C, call, call it SC, V6 plus. So I have not done anything yet. I just putting what I have, the specification. I haven't done anything. I just put what I have. Okay. But how many equations we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. There are six equations. I'm going now, step two. I'm going to write these six equations, arrange the same equation. I'm going to write them. I'm going to write the same equation. But in a way such as that, I'm going to make the external ports in the top. And the internal ports, I'm going to make it in the bottom. Does anybody have an objection? No, I'm just writing the equation as they are. So let's see. If I write these equations. Now, I think this one... I have to go back and forth between these states and one. So I'm going to write the VP here. It's equation, six equations now. But I'm going to put V1 and V4 at the top because they are external. And the internal port V2, V6, V5, D3, because they are internal, I put them at the bottom. Okay? And then here, V14, V4 plus and then V2, V6, V5, V3 plus, okay? Now, if I look at here, if I go back in here, what is V1 minus? What's V1 minus equals from this equation? Yeah, V1 minus equal S11A, V1 plus, plus S12A, V2 plus, right? So I'm going to write these equations, but I'm going to write it with some zeros. So, so this is exactly the first equations. V1 minus equal S11A V1 plus plus S12 V2 plus. Okay. You know when it has V4 plus, V6 plus, V5 plus? Zero, zeros. No objection, I hope. Just the same equation. Okay. Now, if you look at V4 minus, you go to V4 minus, V4 minus here. V4 minus. What is V4 minus? Equal S21B V3 plus, S22B V4 plus, and S23B V3 plus. Correct? Right? So I have I have V4 minus here. So it's not related to V1 plus, right? From here. It's related only V3 plus and V4 plus and V5 plus. So, so what I did here, it's related to 
V4 plus by S2P by H2CP plus by uh, for V5 and for V3 by S21B. Okay. Again, I'm just writing the equations as it is. But I write it such as that the columns in here are the P. This is a vector. I'm going to call it VP minus. And this is a vector. I'm calling it VC minus. And the same thing for the other one. Let's talk about six. Six, which has only one port. What's the relation for six? Six minus equal SC six plus, right? So you go here. V6 minus, all of them zeros, right? But SC equal V6 plus, right? Correct? Again, I'm just rewriting the equation. But when I write this equation on that, I define now SPP, which is a submatrix, SPP, SPC, SCP, and SCC, right? You'll see. I define it as SPP, SPC, and SCC, which are nothing but the same element, uh, the same sum elements of the of the matrices I have. Correct. So this is step two. Step one: define the ports. Step two: write the equations in that format to get to get uh, to get six equations again. But I define the sum matrices. Now, what is a connection matrix? Connection matrix. Connection matrix is relate relate the internal ports to each other. Relate the internal ports to each other. You can see here from V2 plus equal what? V3 minus. Right? V2 plus equal V3 minus from here. You agree? And as well, V2 minus equal V3 plus. Correct? In here, relationship between 5 and 6, both are internal ports. Both are internal ports. V5 minus equal V6 plus. And V6 minus equal V5 plus. Correct? So I'll end up with these equations. So I'm going to remember the connection matrix relate VC minus to VC plus. So I'm going to put VC minus here. V2 minus, V6 minus, V stuff. And then I write these equations. I write this equation in a matrix form. Nothing else. So you see V2 minus equal what? V3 plus. So 0, 0, 0, 1 here. V6 minus from here equal V5, V6 minus equal V5 plus. So I put one here. V5 minus equal V6 plus, so I put one in here, and so on. So I got the matrix, I call it connection matrix. So I got the submatrices, SPP, SPC, SCP, and SCC, and I got the connection matrix, and then the resultant matrix I have is just this one. What is the order of this resultant matrix? What's the order of this resultant matrix? External ports, how many external ports we have? We have two, right? So the resultant matrix should give me a two by two, right? If you think about it, SPP is two by two, right? SPC is what? Two by four, right? Gamma and SCC is four by four. When you invert it, you get four by four, right? So we have here SPC two by four, and this is four by four. And SCP is four by two. So the resultant will end you as well matrix of two by two. So two by two and two by two, the SP will be two by two. Okay. So really it is it is um, it is very uh, very easy to do it, uh, to calculate it. Uh, once you have once you know the scattering matrix of each of each uh, components. You'll be able to, uh, to do it uh, of each network. You'll be able to connect them simply like that. You can program it. Students program that easily. Okay. And then, uh, uh, and by the way, you can do it on the Z matrix level as well. I mean, when I give course on these things, I talk about details more. 
So you can do it as well on the Zen matrix. If you have the Zen matrix of each network, for people who even work in low frequencies, they deal with Zen matrix. If you have several, if you know the multi-port Zen matrix of a network connected to each other, you can repeat the same analysis on the Zen matrix as well. Okay. But for example, like if you have this example in the filter book, you can, uh, I'm not gonna go in details on it, but you can review it. It's the same concept, but I hope that simple example explained to you how it's done. You have a manifold, the manifold, the manifold has say four port. You have the S matrix of the manifold and you have the, the S matrix of each filters. Okay, they are given here. What we need, we need to get the scattering matrix of the the whole the whole multiplexers. Basically, we need to get the relationship between V1 and these ports. So it's a four ports here, device. Okay. And uh, we used to do that at Comdav when we used to develop uh, routines for multiplexer designs. Uh, we have each filter, so we used to combine them. Uh, we didn't have ADS, we didn't have these things back in the old days, so we had to do it by our hand. And it's nice because also, you see, sometimes even when you have a filter, when you have a filter, like for example, if you have a filter and comb line and you wanna make the screws, you wanna know how much you screws, sometimes you get, you define an HFSS uh, uh, virtual ports or fictional ports. You define ports which are not ports, so the filter, you have two ports, internal and external, right? But say on the com line on the top, you can define a port on HFSS. And then on each line, so you can add any capacitance you want. Once you have to do that, you can play with it. It's effectively multi-port network. So it's it has uh, advantage to do, particularly if you develop things in your own, uh, I know sometimes these things can be done by ADS. Uh, now you can get S2P file or S4P file. Uh, in a matter of second, you can simulate it. But if you want to go integrate, say, active components, you play with it on MATLAB yourself, this is useful technique for you uh, to, uh, to, to, to be familiar with. Okay? But there are details in Chapter 5 about the... Uh, about further about this technique. Okay, so I'll stop here. We have a few minutes. If you have any questions related to that section. No one has a question. I have one. Hmm. Um, I think um, you are more uh, so this can be implemented uh, for, let's say, Simulation and theoretical stuff, but um, I think it's more complicated for measurements. And for instance, uh, when you have a net complicated network, let's say a, a circulator, then filter, and you just want to have uh, the S parameter of the filter, when you measure it with a DNA, you have the both. Uh, uh, as parameter, so do you know uh, if, if we can uh, apply these techniques from the external part in order to do internal parts? Well, I mean, your definition of internal ports can be based on up to you. I, I, uh, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but if you have a filters, for example, I can, as I said, I can go inside any filters. I can put on HFSS artificial port. I can do that. In the measurements, you have no options to do that. In the measurements, you have only way to measure the the, 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 the external ports. But always, when we do, sometimes we measure several components and we go to ADS and we define S2P file, S S3P files or whatever, S4P file, and we connect them to get the overall uh, analysis. So ADS can do the same thing, but but sometimes when you try to, when you develop your own tools, when you develop your own techniques, uh, it's nice to know a technique like that because that gives you flexibility to, uh, 
add whatever you want to do to each port, basically. But I cannot go from external to internal uh, from from the measurements. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, if we measure, for example, uh, the, this example uh, on board, if we measure for input output, and if I want to get the, for example, the SA parameter, I can't, uh, I won't be able to, um, from the external element of the world system, I won't be able to um, calculate the SA parameter. That, what, what's your definition of SA? Uh, the, oh, in here. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Um, so what you're saying is that, okay, that's a good question. So what you're saying, I already done the measurements. I think this is a question perhaps which Samir as well was asking yeah. as well. Yeah, and now I understand, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, now that's a very interesting question. So you said, well, you have the external risk parameters of these multiplexers. How can I go back and be able to figure out uh that i think one might be able to do it if you say well you can go back uh i think particularly manifold you need to know as well this one because <laughs> they interact very well you know so you'll be able to you cannot say well uh okay i have that i need to know one you need to know the three and uh, because they interact badly with each other. So it's not clear to me now how you can do it from that. Uh, this more or less some sort of de-embedding basically to be able to get to get what, what, what you want. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, I assume you need the S parameter so to be able to correct the filter to see if there is an issue with that. You'll be able to figure what's the problem with it. Is that the case? Is that the reason? Yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, on, on, on simulation, certainly you, you can do that. On, uh, on, uh, on experimentally, if they connected with flanges, of course, you can get the filter outside. And do it yourself to figure out what it is. Uh, but if they are intact, uh, it's not clear to me how do you embed and you get the response of a filter from the overall uh, stuff. However, there are all sorts of computer edit technique, okay, which you basically try to extract the performance. You know, for the filters, there is a whole chapter, chapter 19, the book on uh, computer edit unit. So we get from the X parameter, from the S parameters, we can figure out, we can figure out the response of the what's wrong inside the filters to be corrected. What is the coupling issues and all of that? The same concept can be done as well on the on the multiplexers. In the sense, you will be able to figure out what is the coupling, the physical coupling you're actually getting out of the. The, if you have several coupling elements, you'll be able to extract the performance of those coupling elements and figure out what they are, okay? So there are computer edit unit techniques done on the diplexer, particularly on the diplexer. People have done a lot on the diplexers, okay? On the multiplexers, uh, you can do to a certain extent, but it's not very well, technique is not very well developed as a diplexer. And for filters, it's very, very, very well developed. In fact, the last day, if I have time, I will talk about some of those techniques, about computer edit tuning technique, because the same technique used for computer edit tuning, it can help you as well in the EM design. Okay? And instead of using the DNA, you can use HFSS to do the same thing and figure out what's wrong in your filter to, to correct. Okay? But it is possible to answer your questions by using computer edit technique but not to get the S parameter of the, uh, maybe if you get the coupling matrix, you'll be able to get the coupling matrix of that filter from the external measurements, okay? And if you have the coupling matrix, you can get the S parameters. Yes, so it can be done. Okay, any other questions?
So thank you for your okay, great. So